Hey guys, Arnav here, back with another video. And the main purpose of today's video is to cover Lewis dot structures. So we're going to be looking at how many valence electrons each atom has, and then integrating that into a diagram. Uh, once again, thank you for your time, and let's get right into it. Hey guys, so again, we're gonna start today's video with our J-pop song recs, which are Bakenoko by Tatsuya Kitani, uh, Kyuto Gureshon by Tatsuya Kitani again, and Inferno by Mrs. Green Apple. I might have butchered the second song, and I apologize for that, but again, these are really good songs, and um, if you give them a listen and like them, then let me know in the comments. All right, uh, before I started the video, I just wanted to go over uh, the number of valence electrons each atom has. And this is a very easy trend that we can tell by analyzing each column on the periodic table. So this first column, hydrogen down, has one valence electron. The second column has two valence electrons. And then we skip all these transition metals and then go to column 13, which has three valence electrons. And then we just keep adding one. So this one has four, five, six, until we reach the final column of noble gases, which all have eight valence electrons. Now this information is really important when drawing out Lewis dot structures. So just try and remember this trend. Now I wanted to go over the steps that we undergo to create a Lewis dot structure. So the first thing to know is that when you are uh, representing a covalent bond, every atom in that bond wants to have eight valence electrons, right? And the exceptions to this are hydrogen. Hydrogen only wants two, but everything else, it wants eight valence electrons, okay? Because that's what's going to put them in their stable state and make them happy. So just know that everything except hydrogen wants eight valence electrons. Also, since it's a covalent bond, we're going to be sharing bonds, right? And um, just know that each shared bond counts as two valence electrons for every atom. So I will explain that further when we dive into the examples. But for now, let's just go through the step-by-step -step process of how to draw them out. So here are the steps. The first one is to count the total number of valence electrons that the molecule has. So um, what you're going to do is count out the number of atoms in the molecule, all the different atoms, find their valence electrons and add them up. The second step is determine the general orientation of how the atoms will be arranged. So what you want to do in most cases is that the atom with the smallest subscript most uh, usually goes in the middle. So if we have H2O, where you have two hydrogens and one oxygen, the oxygen will go in the middle because it has the smallest subscript. And this is quite a consistent trend. The third step is to create like a default or beginner diagram by just connecting all the atoms with one line. And another thing to know is that one line denotes one covalent bond. So that's sharing two valence electrons. The third step is once you have drawn that one line, um, just know that you're going to have some leftover valence electrons because you've not used them all up and you have to integrate them into the diagram to make sure it incorporates all the valence electrons within that molecule. In some cases, by just drawing that simple diagram, you'll be done and in that case, great. Like you don't have to do anything else. Now we have exceptions. AP chemistry has a crap ton of exceptions. So I'm going to go over them right here, right now. For Lewis dot structures, hydrogen and helium, I forgot helium, but hydrogen and helium only need two valence electrons to be stable, all right? So just know that they only need two valence electrons and they'll be happy. Next, putting charges on molecules will increase or decrease the total number of valence electrons. So what I mean by that is, if I have a molecule that when you add up all the valence electrons has, let's say 16 valence electrons, right? If I put a negative charge on that, that negative charge can be assumed to be an electron because electrons are negatively charged. So instead of having 16 valence electrons, it's not gonna have 17. The exact opposite also applies when you put a positive charge. The positive charge can kind of counter one of the valence electrons and reduce the um, number of valence electrons. So we go from 16 valence electrons to 15 valence electrons. So that's something to keep in mind. Finally, Elements that are below the third row can hold more than eight valence electrons when required. And this might seem really confusing, but I will um, display how this actually works in an example that we're gonna go over soon. 
Hey guys, now let's dive into some examples to better understand the concept. So on this slide, let's go over how to make a Lewis diagram for water or H2O. I will link below the periodic table for you guys to refer um, for the number of valence electrons. And if you have one yourself, that's great. That's even better. All right. So the first step is to sum up the total number of valence electrons. So hydrogen has one valence electron and oxygen has six. But since we have two hydrogens in this molecule, we're going to have two valence electrons from hydrogen plus six. So we have a total of eight valence electrons. Now, the next step is to put the atom with the smallest subscript in the middle for like a general diagram, right? In this case, it's going to be oxygen. Now we make our general diagram with the oxygen in the middle, surrounded by the hydrogens, and we draw the lines connecting them because the lines signify one bond and that is the minimum you require for the molecule to exist. So just to like um, uh, keep this in mind, since we have drawn two lines and each line depicts two valence electrons, we have used up four valence electrons so far, right? And since we have a total of eight, we still have four valence electrons left. So our last step is to integrate them into this Lewis dot structure. Now that's what the final structure will look like. And the reason is, um, let's analyze the reason. So hydrogen and hydrogen, both the hydrogens, are happy because they have the two valence electrons they need in the form of the bonds, right? And as we discussed before, unlike other elements, hydrogens just need two valence electrons to be happy. So they're satisfied with their current bonding state. However, oxygen needs eight valence electrons, right? Because it's not covered in those exceptions. So it has four valence electrons from these bonds and it needs four more to have that octet. And coincidentally, we also had four valence electrons left over, right? From the previous step. And what we do is we just uh, represent them as dots around oxygen. These dots are known as lone pairs, and they are pairs of electrons that orbit whichever atom they're around. So uh, finally, we end up with oxygen having eight valence electrons and being happy, and the hydrogens having two each. Now, some of you might be wondering, how is it that the two valence electrons are both present in the hydrogen and the oxygen? So why are these two for hydrogen and for oxygen? And that's because they're being shared, right? Because it's a covalent bond. And since they're constantly moving between the two atoms, they are considered to be a part of both of them. So technically speaking, these two valence electrons count as two valence electrons for hydrogen and also two valence electrons for oxygen. So that's also something to keep in mind. Next up, let's up the ante a bit. Now let's make the Lewis dot structure for SO3. Again, the first step is to sum up the total number of valence electrons. And from the periodic table, you guys can probably tell that sulfur and oxygen both have six valence electrons. And since we have three oxygens and we have one sulfur, we're gonna do six times four, which gives us 24 total valence electrons. Now the next step is figuring out which atom goes in the middle. In this case, since sulfur has the smallest subscript, it's going to go in the middle. Finally, we have the basic diagram that we make in step three. So here we have the sulfur surrounded by the three oxygen atoms with one line drawn between them. Again, this step is around when we need to take note of how many electrons we have used up. So at this step, we have used up six valence electrons, right? Because we've drawn three pairs and 24 minus six is 18. So we still have 18 more valence electrons left to integrate into all the different atoms. Now, before I go to step four, I'm gonna give you guys a second to try it yourself, and then we can double check if need be. All right, I'm assuming you guys gave it a shot. So that's what the final bond looks like. All right, so we have a lot to discuss here, so let's get right to it. First, let's talk about the outer oxygens. Let's talk about these two first. So, we know that they both have two valence electrons as of right now, because they had the two bonds, but in reality, they need eight. So we assign them three lone pairs or six valence electrons on top of that uh, bonds like valence electrons, and they both have eight now. So in total, we have used up 16 valence electrons. 
and we have eight left because the total is 24. So what do we do with those remaining eight? Well, we already used one of the eight in that bond we originally made between the sulfur and the third oxygen. And here is where things get interesting. So again, what we do is we um, give the lone pairs to the oxygen because that makes sense. So we give two lone pairs. So this oxygen has six and the sulfur has um, two from here, two from here and two from here. But here's the thing. If we were to give the third lone pair to oxygen, oxygen would be happy. It would have its eight valence electrons. However, the sulfur would only have six because it would have two from here, two from here, and two from here. So instead, what we have done is we've taken one of those lone pairs of oxygen and converted it into a bond. Now, this is a double bond, and those are legal for those of you that didn't watch the last video. And we can go up to a max of three bonds between two atoms. So effectively, by making this double bond here, what we have done is we've made all the atoms happy. So these oxygens were already happy with their eight valence electrons. And now this oxygen is also happy with its two lone pairs and two valence electrons, which is a total of eight. And the sulfur is also happy with its four bonds, which gives it eight valence electrons. So really you need to be like really in the mindset to just look around and make sure that everyone's happy and has their eight valence electrons. And that's a skill you're going to acquire as you keep on doing these problems over and over again. So I would really recommend practicing them a lot. Now this third one is an exception that we originally discussed where we are going to make a um, Lewis dot structure for BR4 minus. Now you see the minus, right? And given the exceptions at the beginning, we know that this molecule is going to have one valence electron on top of the sum of the valence electrons because that minus charge acts like an electron. So bromine has seven valence electrons and fluorine also has seven. So seven times five, because there's five total atoms, gives us 35 valence electrons. But wait, we have that minus also. So we add one on top of 35 and come up with 36 valence electrons. So that's our first step done. Second step is figuring out which atom to put in the middle and it's going to be bromine because it has the smallest subscript. Finally, we have like the rough sketch we make where we put the bromine in the middle, surround with fluorines and connect them with one bond each. And if we pay attention here, we have used up eight valence electrons in the form of four bonds. So we have 36 minus eight or 28 valence electrons left. Now here's the final diagram. I know it looks really complicated and really scary, but let's go over it really quick. All right, so first, we saw that all the fluorides only had two valence electrons. So to complete their octet, we assigned all of them six more in the form of lone pairs. So let's just take this fluorine for example. It had two valence electrons already, and then we gave it three lone pairs for it to have eight and be a happy atom. So given that we assigned three lone pairs to all the fluorides, giving them eight valence electrons, we used up eight times four, or 32 valence electrons, right? That means we have four valence electrons left. But you might be wondering that this bromine is also happy because it has two, four, six, eight valence electrons. So it's like content and it doesn't need any more. But those remaining four valence electrons have to go somewhere, right? And they end up going on the bromine because uh, from the exception slide, the third slide was that any um, elements below the third column or oh, sorry, below the third row, can hold more than eight valence electrons. And since bromine is below the third row, we can assign those remaining valence electrons to the middle in the form of two lone pairs. And finally, these brackets and that negative outside is just standard notation, because since we had that negative charge over here, we have to show that in the final Lewis diagram also. So if that were a plus charge, we would put a plus on here instead. So just remember to put the brackets and the charge outside. Again, this exception is low-key kind of common on the AP exam. So just know if your element is row three or below, it can hold more than eight valence electrons in the middle. So guys, thanks for watching and I hope you found the video helpful. If you're feeling extra generous, why not like and subscribe the video? And if you have any comments, then don't feel afraid to leave them down below. 
I have also left my email if you don't feel comfortable commenting. So just email me whenever. I'm just here. I'll respond. And yeah, thanks and peace.